And now it's Boomer Life. Lifestyle ideas designed to make your life more engaging, meaningful, and complete. Celebrating the baby boomer generation, this is Boomer Life. Welcome back to Boomer Life on AM650. My name is Simone Graywall. We're chatting today about the ins and out of addiction. In studio with us, we have Jason Spees, who is the Executive Director and Interventionist at LDR Holistic Wellness Center. Now, Jason, we talked a little bit about there being two sides of the fence. Uh, to recap, what is one side before we get into the whole other side of the fence? Yeah, um, so to go back to what we're talking about in the first segment is is that you know, there's those families that really have a limited amount of experience exposure to addiction. They're scratching their head. They don't really understand what it is that, you know, um, that they're witnessing or, or experiencing. And, and so there's a lot of confusion and frustration. They might have indications that, that you know, the drinking's got out of control or possibly they're doing other, you know, sedatives or uh, drugs. And so the, now the other side of the coin is really those families that, um, and, and in terms of contacting me as an interventionist, um, so this is the other major group, if you will, of a family phoning me with uh, an overwhelming amount of information. Um, and it's very clear that they're dealing with um, an individual that has a full-blown addiction. You know, families are often aware of the um, the macro, the, you know, the 50,000 feet and above impacts of addiction. However, they're seldom aware, in my experience anyways, and in my opinion, of the subtle but yet powerful unspoken agreements and adjustments and accommodations that they make along the way. And this is almost something that's been kind of woven into the fam, uh, the, sorry, the fabric of the family system. Okay. Um, and so, you know, as families, um, you know, really believe that they uh, might have some awareness around this, um, generally reality is, is that more than not anyways, is that they've really bought into a trap. And I want to explain that a little bit. So this is that other side of the coin, and 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 we've really um, termed this this phrase, but we call it the addict's charter of rights. Okay. And um, it might sound like a bit of a silly mm -hmm. thing, but it, in my years of experience, I I, I really feel this is. Um, uh, something that we've gotten our hands around. And so this is a set of expectations and rules um, and demands that have been imposed on the family, sometimes over a short period of time and sometimes over a long period of time. And obviously the family in turn, with well-intentioned support, become essentially the co-creators um, in this uh, victim-hostage dynamic. So for addiction to survive, there must be a system of support to maintain it. And so there's this yin and yang. It's like anything in life. You know, I have to have air to breathe. Um, you know, I, if I have a business, I have to have product to sell. So there has to be the support system that's generally always there for addiction to survive. And I, I want to describe this a little bit because this is where I really get, I, this is where I find um, I do some of my greatest work. So I get pretty excited about okay. it. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited to hear. So uh, you, basically, let me describe some of the dynamics to illustrate my point. So as the person of concern, or the you know addict or alcoholic moves through the experimental, recreational, social, chronic, and habitual stages, and we've described this in earlier shows, mm -hmm. um, the family system undergoes its own emotional and mental stages of change. And as the addiction creates greater negative impact on the family, um, they in turn make greater adjustments and or sacrifices, accommodations, you know, all of these things that a family naturally does um, to try and maintain balance. And, uh, you know, family systems are designed to ultimately achieve balance. People want to feel a sense of connection. People want to feel a sense of accountability. Nobody likes living in chaos. No. So the family is always trying to make these adjustments. The addict's charter of rights is when a loved one or someone within the group is unable to basically consistently meet a need. And then the whole group then becomes responsible for picking up the slack. It's just like if you live in your home and you're the one neat freak, you know, and everybody <laughs> else is making a mess. It's like, how do you be the person that that, you know, do you keep cleaning up or do you just say, I'm going to live in this mess? It's, it's kind of one of those things. Everybody needs to become a part of the team work together and help yeah. and it's the same in this situation yeah and a, another great example of that is is that you know when one of our loved ones gets sick mm -hmm. and they have some major function within the family unit maybe they can't go to work the rest of the family chips in and and does Helps what they out. can to help out yeah 
So, the, you know, this is really a completely acceptable um, in almost any family situation, except when it relates to addiction. And, for example, as the addict becomes sicker or more um, evolved into their, their uh, dependency stages, um, they're unable to usually attend to the responsibilities and, and all the accountabilities that are, are in our lives. And so, generally, the families start um, covering with, you know, some pretty simple things in the beginning. It might be just even, um, oh, you've lost your license, so I'll drive you to work. Or you can't pay the bill this month, so I'll pay the bill. Give you me some extra money. Give yeah. you some extra, eat, you know, and, and they haven't been eating, so let's go take you shopping. You know, you haven't had a new ch clothes, so we'll go get... So it can be some really subtle things. And as we start moving through the progression, it gets the family actually starts feeling like they're making some wins. Okay. And this is the element um, that's very um, unique to the addiction cycle is because the family, in essence, is starting to feel like they actually have some control. Um, and they do uh, for small periods of time. So that's the seductive nature of where a family starts to get involved with addiction. And next thing you know, I want to remind you again that the addict's job is to limit the amount of exposure that the family has had to their behaviors and what's really going on behind the scene. So the family isn't, you know, it, it, they're going along this usually in a very innocent, pure, driven motive. And so that's where I want to keep the judgment away because a lot of times families uh, phone me and they're in this, this huge judgment about themselves. So, again, in a thousand ways, there's such an illusion of seduction, uh, you know, of that control aspect. And, um, you know, the transfer of control from the addict to the family really creates the cycle of remorse and self-pity, guilt, low self-esteem, especially for the addict. And so it's almost like this fuel in the tank for the addict. Um, I'm not able to be self-sufficient. Poor me. Life's beating me up. And, you know, and now the family is controlling me because they've taken in control of over all my activities and my responsibilities. Therefore, the only thing that I can make myself feel better with is a drink or a drug, right? Exactly. If you're just joining us on Boomer Life on an AM 650, my name is Simone Graywell. Today we are talking about the ins and outs of addiction. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction or dependency issues, in studio with us an expert, Jason Spees, the Executive Director and Interventionist at LDR Holistic Wellness Center, online at holisticdrugrehab.org. Now there was an example of a story that uh, you wanted to share with us. Yeah, yeah. You know, I tell families when they phone me, I, and, and it you know, I try and use stories to help people understand possibly what they're feeling. And, and I call it the trampoline story. Okay. And if you could picture the family um, all around this trampoline holding on to the steel edges of the trampoline. There's no feet. It, I mean, the family's holding this trampoline up. The addict gets on the trampoline. Now, most families are the trampoline. So they're there to help buffer some of the, you know, again, somebody being sick. They all, you know, um, grab the trampoline and take turns helping each other out. For an addict, they get on the trampoline and they bounce and they bounce and they bounce and they're, they're, they're not getting off the trampoline. And so the family becomes exhausted. And so the system starts having some really negative consequences. So now the family's feeling frustrated, angry, hostile, yet... It's, a, it's an emotional time to be going through this. It's such an emotional roller coaster. And families with the drapes drawn feel that in their home or in their world, if you will, are the only ones suffering. They might identify, yes, other people do this, but when it's in our family, there is nothing in my experience that impacts a family greater in terms of a negative way than addiction. And we talked about this earlier because there's a lot of, you know, some people have a lot of pride when it comes to the family. Mm. There's shame and there's guilt, but really this is no different than a sickness. If you have, uh, you know, a son or your husband and they have a cough, you're not going to hide that from the world and say, oh, my, my son has a cough. Yeah. You know, that's something you would talk about. So this is something that should people should be educated on, that it is really a sickness and yeah. there's help. It's a disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a disease. And the stigma around addiction still is so strong. And again, when you have a culture that celebrates alcohol, for example, 
And then you have an individual that's not participating well with that image of what alcohol should give us, the you know, the fruits of the world, the excitement, the parties, the girls, the, you know, the mm -hmm. glam and fam, right? Yeah. Um, it, what does this say about the individual, right? So there's still these st stigmas that prevent people from accessing help. And the issue that I have with that, and one of the reasons why I'm here today, Simone, is to let families know that the sooner that you, you identify this and reach out for help, um, you, you don't need to suffer. It's an optional. Uh, you, you know, you don't need to suffer with this anymore. Get a, a professional, whether it's us or somebody else out there involved, and at least start doing some discovery. And this is why, you know, LDR really um, focus 80 90 percent of our interventions towards the family because it's the family system that's been propping this up generally when um, that's not around the addiction normally crumbles believe it or not really yeah it's it's uh it's pretty amazing to families when they start taking a role especially with our educational component of our intervention they start the light bulb starts going off i never knew that i you know i was playing this role in terms of again going to the charter of rights as i become sicker as an addict and you start picking up more and more of my responsibilities mm -hmm. it's almost this assumed entitlement so I don't need to have my rent money because, you know, nobody's going to help me with that. Help I don't need to go to the grocery store because I'm getting my meals brought to me or getting and, help with that. And in a lot of ways, that really confirms that my family loves me. Yeah. So isn't it interesting that it confirms love, but then when I'm finished doing my drugs or alcohol and I'm out of money, I go through this extreme depression and shame and guilt. Cyclical, just back it's and this, forth. Exactly. Now, how would a family know if, if you know, someone listening right now is, is going through something similar, how would they know if an intervention is what's suitable? Well, let's take a look at some of the key indicators. And, and this is, again, over my um, years of experience. And I, I'm just going to bring out a few. But, you know, really when a lifestyle of the addict begins to tear the family apart. They're, and, again, we don't have to have, I've seen them drink, I've seen them do this drug. Um, many times families are looking for that um, ammunition that I can put my finger on this now. Please don't allow that to happen. Um, you've noticed a progression in negative symptoms um, as a family. Um, has a person maybe suffered consequences may, uh, directly associated with their drink? You know, DUIs, relationships, um, financial, maybe they're not able to, they're not sustainable anymore. It could be affecting work life, maybe getting fired from a job or having some issues come up at work, things absolutely. like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, 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 you know, this is where, um, we have to be careful too, because they, they might not have all these symptoms. And we see a lot of times where people are very successful in lots of areas of their life and they're using the drugs or the alcohol to really stimulate them or, or, um, use it as a performance answer. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So um, other things, um, you know, do, do the alcoholic or addict um, try to change, but invariably, you know, they go back to some of those old patterns and behaviors. We have seen no rhyme or reason to this where sometimes um, an individual has been successful in staying off drugs or alcohol for a day, a month, a year. Um, but that's not where we focus our attention on. It's all of the things behind the addiction. So um, remember that these cycles, um, you know, really can be over a long period of time. Um, also, have you tried addressing the problem with little or no success? Sometimes there's a lot of resistance there, anger and deflection, dishonesty. So these are some of the things that, you know, families would start to have, um, you know, indicators in terms of is an intervention suitable for me or not. So, yeah. And it could be just really maybe even going with your gut instinct sometimes because you feel like something is off and that person may be telling you, no, I'm okay, everything's fine, so you might brush it off. But then again, this, this unsettling feeling keeps popping up that you kind of need to reach out. You bring up an excellent point that um, thank you for, for bringing that up because I get a, a, an enormous amount of phone calls from loved ones with exactly that. I can't put my finger on it. Mm -hmm. I've tried addressing this. I can't get the information or, or the facts, but yet something is telling me that th this is going off the wall. And so, you, you know what, absolutely. Again, the addict or the alcoholic's job is to create this illusion that I'm okay. 
If you're joining us, we are. This is Boomer Life on AM650. I'm Simone Graywall, and in studio we have with us Jason Spees, who is the executive director and interventionist at LDR Holistic Wellness Center. And we've been talking about the ins and outs of addiction uh, online at holisticdrugrehab.org. Lots more to cover. Stay with us, AM650. It's Boomer Life. It's all about the baby boomer lifestyle. Boomer Life on AM650.